Uh, this next session, which has been sponsored by the City of Surrey, thank you City of Surrey, um, is a new element to our summit and one we're really excited about. When the uh, summit committee was formed and I was asked to chair a subcommittee of that, which is the Public Art Roundtable or the pre-conference session, we were also tasked with um, this new 45-minute session, which was to bring forward through a jury process of our peers um, an opportunity to experience and see some stuff. I love looking at images and pictures and things, and this is an opportunity to see some amazing public art projects from across the country. And this was our criteria as we set this for this first year, was to see projects from across the country based on what was submitted, to look at projects large and small, um, and to be inspired by things that are going on in the public art field, which we've come to um, acknowledge, I think, through this conference and past years, um, how important this field is into the practice, particularly at the municipalities. At the pre-conference session on Tuesday, I did acknowledge this subcommittee, and I want to take the opportunity to thank them again, because it was a great committee to work with, and uh, we worked really hard in trying to set these, this a standard, I think, of a way to go forward in our future. So thank you to Lori Stalker from Morinville, Jamie McClellan from Halifax, Patrick McCormick from Kelowna, Melissa Black from Ottawa, Lisa Basura from Calgary, and Anna Whalen from our CCNC office. Can you please give them a round of, a hand, a round of applause? So we have 45 minutes for this session. Each of our presenters has been tasked with a four minute presentation. Um, and I'm sure most of the material goes well beyond that, so there's a bit of a pressure for them. The way it's going to work, I will call each of them up, they'll present, they will get their one minute remaining reminder, and then at the end, they're going to hear that, which means time is up, and we'll go on to the next presentation. So that's how we're going to um, work our next 45 minutes. Please sit back and enjoy. Um, what we have to offer. We, just one other note, we will be going in the order of the program, which is located on page 23 of your document there. So our first up is the work Chinook Arc by City of Calgary. And on behalf of my colleagues at the City, I am presenting Chinook Arc, which is a very much loved public art installation in one of our inner city neighborhoods. And it was commissioned through the City of Calgary's public art program on behalf of our Parks Department. So to start, the site was originally a sports field located in what's called the Beltline District. It was adjacent to a now defunct school, which has become part of the Calgary Board of Education's new headquarters. And the city was able to purchase this plot of land and went forward with community consultations to find out what the public wanted to do with it. And their voice was pretty clear. They wanted a neighborhood park, a quiet place for reading, small community gatherings, and most notably for us, they wanted a compelling public art piece. So we had to go forward and find that compelling art piece. We put out a call to artists asking those interested to submit their qualifications. Over 50 applied and they were then juried down to three who were invited to provide proposals. And at the end of the day, this team of Joe O'Connell and Blessing Hancock were the ones who were selected. They eventually went on to work with Joe's fabricating company, Creative Machines, and local Calgary company, F&D Scene Changes. Why were they chosen? Well, the jury felt their work was bold. They felt that it was going to be perhaps one of the largest acrylic exterior public art pieces in Canada, if not North America. They also felt it had impact. The fact that the work would have such a substantial day and night presence was a key factor for the jury, as well as the potential layers of interactivity, which could engage the public on a regular basis. And in 2014, we were able to see this concept through to completion. The artwork was inspired metaphorically by the old streetcar line, which used to loop around the Beltline area, while physically taking its inspiration from the arching Chinook cloud, which any of you who've been to Calgary know frequent our skies on a regular basis. But in the artist's words, the piece itself resembles a floating cloud. 
From a bird's eye view, the sculpture helps to anchor the contemporary nature of the site, its distinguished form, setting it apart from its surroundings, but also adding to the visual richness of this diverse community. But on a more personal scale, the daylight illuminates the acrylic skin, revealing the skeletal infrastructure of the work itself, and also inviting people to explore the enclosed space in the center of the sculpture, framing the sky and presenting opportunities for new visual discovery and perhaps new perspectives. And then at night, it changes. It morphs into an illuminated color environment responsive to public interaction. This interactivity is designed to allow the participant to change the programmed light sequence by waving their hands, placing an object, or playing a video in front of a sensor. This enables the public to become creators as they turn the entire sculpture into a low resolution screen which reproduces the colors and motions of their interaction. But it wasn't just about creating a public art piece and putting it in place. The artists were also tasked with something we call community cultural development. They chose to do this by working with the local arts community, commissioning local composer Lorna McLaughlin to create an original score which was inspired by this new work. And as Slava plays debuted during the sculptures and veiling ceremony, an event which focused on revealing the possibilities of connection, interaction, and inspiration this new public artwork could provide. And it lives on. It has its own Facebook presence, its own Twitter presence, a way to encourage the community to celebrate and contribute to this artwork on a continual basis, helping to define Chinook Arc as a marker for its community, an animator of its space, and a gathering point for citizens and visitors to connect and engage. Imagine a wall transforming into a gallery at night. I'm going to be presenting the City of Surrey's Urban Screen, which is um, really projecting interactive art at night. Urban Screen was launched in 2010. It was really imagined by the artist um, that came out of the art in resident, artist in residence with the Surrey uh, um, Tech Lab. And the city built this based on their um, vision. And it has um, really been a story about grow, nurture, and celebration. It's um, the public art piece of the uh, Chuck Bailey Recreation Center. <laughs> I'm going to move over here. Um, so it uh, is on the west wall of the um, center. It is a high powered data projectors to illuminate the entire west wall of the Chuck Bailey Rec Center. Imagery generated by computers. And it's possibly the largest uh, permanent art dedicated outdoor projection in um, Canada. The image is uh, at the height is nine meters and the length is 30 meters. It serves as a free outdoor gallery presenting digital and interactive art by Canadian international artists and can be seen by those at the rec center, the adjacent uh, youth park, and people passing on the SkyTrain. The gallery curates and partners to present a rotating exhibition and events during the annual season that runs from September through to May and starts 30 minutes after dark and ends at midnight. Urban Screen has stimulated the imagination and creativity of artists, encouraging them to create artworks using newly developed technology and projects that are inspired by the intention of the venue and its context. Each project builds on the previous artists. They share the codes, um, the manual is updated, and equipment is added. Artworks have featured technology as diverse as virtual piano, gaming engines, and have used um, the SkyTrain or the levels of the Fraser River to be an activator uh, to generate uh, the image changing. Premiering in 2014 on Urban Screen, which is on your screen here, is Longing and Forgetting. It ran as a generative video and as an interactive artwork. Video characters inhabited the west wall of the Chuck Bailey Center 
and they sat on the ledges, climbed the wall, and uh, uh, looked out towards people passing on the sky train. Logging for getting is an outcome of innovative research supported by multiple national grants the, from the social science and humanity research and the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council that explores how movement can be used more expressively and intelligently within interactive technologies. The top two images show the stage set that was created to film the dancers and the, um, you'll see how windows were created to match which would um, later be <coughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyhow, using the gyroscope and accelerometer uh, mobile devices can um, uh, activate this. And uh, I'll just end. Go check us out on the Urban Screen website and you'll learn more about it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anita. Um, Vancouver was the first municipality in Canada to. Um, proclaim a year of reconciliation, which occurred between 2013 and 2014. And with Reconciliation Canada, as a partnership uh, with, led by Chief Robert Joseph, um, we, we did a number of activities that were meant to witness and build relationship between Aboriginal and all, uh, Aboriginal peoples and all Canadians. And after this first year happened, um, Vancouver declared that it wanted to become the first city of reconciliation in Canada. So um, what we did was we did a call for uh, two-dimensional projects on uh, various platforms that we could use so that a lot of these artists were not necessarily artists that had been commissioned for public art before. Um, so we did a call um, for temporary artworks on these 10, uh, on these various screens, and uh, 10 artists were selected through a national call. It was really important to the panel that it not be limited to First Nations artists, but it be open to everyone. And all of the, all of the artwork spoke to the, the, sit, the theme of reconciliation. Um, <clears throat> it was also one of the 31 projects chosen by Americans for the Arts as one of the top uh, projects in North America for public art in 2014. Um, this is a, 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 one of the transit shelter posters by Dion Paul from the Seashell Nation. And I'll go pretty quickly through some of the other platforms. Uh, these are more about bus shelters. This one is Sonny Asu, um, and he uses popular culture graphics uh, advertising with First Nations iconography to, to really create eye-catching imagery. Um, This is called Giants Among Us by BC Arts Brack and Hannes Corlett. And it uses images inspired by myths, aboriginal myths um, about overcoming monsters. This next one called The Underlying States, which was a collaboration of four artworks by three artists named Tanya Willard, Gabrielle Hill, and Peter Morin, was based upon the whole exquisite corpse notion of creation, uh, where they saw one portion of the uh, panel and did their work and then passed it on to the next artist and the next artist. Um, and um, it was used to uh, evoke some deep psychological associations that the, that the artists felt were uh, triggered by this notion of reconciliation. And uh, the next one is uh, called It's Written on Your Face by Jeanette Sirwa from Surrey. Um, and they were hyper-realistic drawings on the faces uh, of the models. Uh, and it spoke to the, the, the issues of reconciliation. And the final uh, transit shelter is See Me, See Me by Alexa Hatanaka. So then the two other platforms that we used were the library banners in the main library in downtown. Um, Vancouver, and this is Brian Liu from Vancouver, and they were, uh, they were six welcoming hands uh, that uh, were 
I don't know. <laughs> I'm not speaking very clearly on that, but it, 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 quite beautifully, beautiful imagery. The final platform were video screens, and we did it several commissions on the video screens. Um, this is Emily Crew's beautiful work, uh, which was recreating Chilcot <laughs> uh, uh, weaving. And I'll just go through the other two quickly. One is from the uh, apology from the Harper government on uh, the, the, the things done to uh, First Nations peoples. And then the final one was on uh, the city center station. And it was by Christabel Stewart. Um, and it was a combination of both um, an image as well as a video. Thank you. project is really a, a real simple one that was uh, part of an opportunity that happened last year and during the city's 140th anniversary. And uh, so our, our collection uh, has more visual art rather than literary art, so we wanted to have some way to celebrate that. So, so what we will kind of decided was that um, we took some inspiration from the city of St. Paul and, um, and kind of played with the idea of uh, having poetry. And, um, but then we have tons of walls in the city, but the other thing that we had a lot of, of course, was uh, sidewalks, uh, hundreds and miles and miles of sidewalks. So we thought, what a great idea to actually put that in real accessible spaces and in neighborhoods that, that we had. So we invited the uh, community, uh, uh, citizens who were current as well as past residents to actually create uh, a poem. Uh, and you didn't have to be a poet, so anyone could write a poem. So it would be a free verse, a haiku, um, uh, a limerick, a rhyme, anything like that. And because it was the city's 140th birthday, we used that platform actually to actually use social media as an engagement tool. So of course, Twitter is a maximum of 140 characters. So that was a challenge out to the community. And in a very short time, um, we had this pro project for about, uh, uh, ran it for about two months. The call itself was really only about two weeks. We had 60 poems, and each um, resident normally only actually um, submitted an average of one poem. So, um, and we had a ton of submissions from both adults, kids, and uh, youth. So we chose 10 out of that, and we worked with the, um, the Holy Well Poets, as well as the Golden Years uh, Writers uh, Club, and the, our Municipal Accessibility Committee. The other committee that I didn't write in down and which is quite important is actually our engineering um, an operations center actually they were quite critical to this and um, and so we kind of put that out and you can kind of see that we chose the the 10 and we celebrate that that um, at um, the 140th back in September and um, and it was during our farmers market so we kind of did an opening that kind of tagged on to another really, really successful um, um, event that we had uh, at the farmer's market and, uh, and had all the kind of um, the winners kind of recite their, their poems. So um, this project's two phases. One is um, uh, temporary and the second one is more permanent. The temporary one is on these vinyl over laminates that you see because we wanted to test um, how people would react to it. And so we put those down and people throughout the entire summer, and it was the summer of this year, about four months, they were quite successful and people kept looking at them, reading them, and they were uh, scattered throughout our downtown, our city core. So now um, we kind of um, look at uh, our next phase, which is actually the permanent one. And I'm really excited about this, and I was hoping to be able to share some pictures of the final, but um, because of the fact that uh, it was delayed, we could we couldn't, and I have to give a shout out to our ops department because they really took this on and embraced it, and um, um, you know, and, and was able to really help me put this together. Because not only do you have to find the fabricator, but really someone who understood cement. And I, I know lots about cement today than I ever want to know. And uh, and as I said, you know, the collaboration between departments is quite critical. And I have to say that the uh, the ops department has embraced it. And in fact, the um, uh, manager says to me, "So I guess you want um, Scott." 
want to actually do this because he's it was the expert was with cement uh, background and I said yes that's a great idea and he didn't even ask me for a GL so I'm really <laughs> excited about that <laughs> so we did so this is our, um, our our test right now with that and you can see that we made some mistakes and the ones that that we can do uh, better so here's the final slide to show you kind of um, what the mocks look like and how we kind of would embed that onto the concrete we thought it was just as I say you know a, a great idea for um, our city to be going to have like uh, po poems written by people all from all our citizens and uh, be able to enjoy that literary, literary culture that makes our city. So th thank you, and you can follow us on our fa on our both our Twitter as well as uh, Facebook and our website. So I have a video that's been produced by Concord ADEX. Some of you heard me speak yesterday with Gabriel Lung of Concord ADEX. This is another project that they've done, and uh, you'll see him in the video. I have slides, but I don't want to hear that horrible sound at the end. So we'll just show the video, and then I'll just give a couple of comments at the end. Thank you. And thank you to Adam for making us look good. <laughs> There's that period in spring in Toronto. It's about... 10 days where the entire city is just filled with color. All the apple, all those trees are just covered in blossoms. I wanted to get that feeling of renewal, but I wanted to hint at how fugitive that moment is in the calendar. It's, a, it's kind of a moment. You know, you blink, it's over. It started with two elements exterior pieces, which are called windscreens, and images of tree blossoms that go from the ground floor all the way up to the 35th floor. And then we developed a kind of a pixelated image of one of the blossoms, which we have painted over the cladding on the roof of the building. And then a third element was added two years into the project. It's not part of the public art. This is a private part, which is to extend the imagery into the building. The work is a series of photographs integrated into a, a film that is then put into uh, the glazing units of the building. State Windows are doing the installation uh, alongside PCL, a construction company. We're about halfway done the installation. Um, as you can see, the building is still under construction. Um, so it's going to be a few more months until we're wrapping up. Residents will be able to see the effect of the art glass at the ends of the hallways of the floors that they live on. And then from the outside, they'll read as a, as a sort of glowing beacon that run up along the sides of the tower. So it's like a spine of color that runs up the building. The colors are typical spring blossom colors. What we've done really is create a kind of new version of stained glass. actually meaningful to us in many ways. Concord Park Place is a 45-acre big project. It takes a long time to build. At the moment, where you're standing in Tango is our second project. So we are very much in the spring of our career in this development. Public art humanizes the built environment and it invigorates public spaces. It gives community a strong sense of place and identity. My father was an avid gardener. For him, that moment in spring when the trees blossomed, he always found that was the sort of key moment when you were rewarded for winter. I began to learn through Gabriel uh, what their ambitions were for this site. It was really the development of a community and a kind of renewal of land. So it was this idea of renewal that was so key to me. So that's really it. I have a catalog here, one, um, and I'd like to thank everyone. I had a dream last night at this presentation. There were six people sitting on a couch and three of them walked out in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> so thank you very much. I really appreciate the award. <laughs> so the art of storytelling inclusion in public spaces, it uh, covers two different programs that we have, a temporary uh, art program, which is uh, sitting at the urban design project 
the department and the community development is the permanent public art. How can I move this? Okay. So art create relationship, we know all that. I'm gonna skip that one. So we, we started with a piece that commemorate the War of 1812, but the artists that got selected, a team of artists that represent three different communities, that's why it's, it's called inclusion and alliance. They talk about the experience between the, 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 that relationship between the Aboriginal community in the, in the War of 1812 and how it's less recognized in that. And they moved east. It was a big presentation. The, it was, this project was a $320,000 budget. And it was a donation from the White Dakota First Nation, uh, an inspiration about partnerships and, and, and community engagement. With, uh, the project got ahead uh, one week or two weeks because they wanted the narratives and, and the space to be animated because of a visit of the Prince Edward of, uh, of Wessex. And you see there's a lot of protocols and a lot of uh, issues uh, for the visit and, and, and they connected together in a big celebration. And I'm gonna go quickly with some of the images. It was about ceremony, education, and commemoration all together. You see, uh, it was in impressive how to bring all this community to this space that was a roundabout that was empty, was empty for years. And then after this project, people gathered there. There were diversity and inclusion, that's big in Saskatoon at the moment. And those were the three artists, as you see, there's a team of a French Canadian, a, a British Canadian, and Aboriginal from the Sisika Nation. I Am The Bridge was another temporary project that included uh, many things, and it's a, a place where there's a problem of pigeon, uh, poop and people don't want to walk around there. So basically we transformed that place and, and what was innovative about this place is that it legitimized a, a non-artistic infrastructure into a cultural space. So there we've been doing for two years. We have a temporary art installation and this is felt installation and then there's a lot of community engagement through that process and then we align it to culture days. And some of the literary arts and other uh, initiatives as well. This was a, a meditation project that occurred as part of the 20th anniversary of the art placement program. The installation was just discussions to invite people to see it, but also uh, spoke about the empty spaces and the, the different public art that was installed in, in, in Saskatoon for 20 years. Some images. And then the, uh, this is it in, to include other communities uh, uh, in the placemaker program. It talks about uh, a taking approach of guerrilla theater, uh, and it's an organ that plays music and seed birds. I had a, a little video here, but I cannot play, it's not enough time. So basically, <laughs> uh, this organ player, this artist did a performance and talk about uh, environmental issues, immigration, and 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 the German heritage of Saskatoon, which is the second largest language spoken in, in, in the province. Engaging with community is very important. Kids get to play here, work, and design all that project. And that's it. Hi, I'm Tricia. I manage the public art um, program for the Winnipeg Arts Council. Thank you. So we have a diverse program of international, national, local uh, commissions. We also have um, an artist in residence and city facilities program. And we also have this community art program that we've called With Art. And that, that's uh, the project we're going to talk about today as part of that program. We called With Art, With Art very deliberately because it's a program that matches artists with community groups and the art is not about or for the community, but with them. We, um, sorry, we facilitate a matching process and we ask that both parties come to the table with no preconceptions of what will be made. It's a way of expressing identity, working through issues and building community through art making. In this project, artist Dimitri Melman worked with the Wrench, the Winnipeg Repair Education and Cycling Hub. It's a really fantastic organization, a community bike shop that functions on donations and bicycles reclaimed from landfill. 
Their deep commitment to giving people skills and resources to build or repair their own bikes is reflected in their community outreach. The Wrench provides services to inner city youth, newcomers, women's shelters, and employment training centers. They were eager to work with an artist to offer their community new ways of telling stories. Dimitri was engaged with hundreds of participants over the course of a year to make art from recycled bike parts, mosaics, and paint. They worked on individual pieces and on collaborative works as well, including a, a bike rack, which I'll show you in a minute. The key to this program is the process, coming together on a shared goal and seeing it through in a new perspective, through the lens of art making. As the director of The Wrench said, um, a big part of The Wrench is recycling. We'd rather reuse everything we can. So with art was not only exciting, but it was a solution to one of our problems. Let's utilize as much as we can while helping people explore all kinds of ideas around cycling and community. A major part of any With Art project is the final celebration where we invite in the broader public with food, drink, and an opening. The ranch is located actually in an industrial area just on the edge of the inner city in Winnipeg, and it shares the building with the Animal Services Department. So at the opening, we actually had tours of the dog kennels as well, and you could take dogs out for walks and things. It's a really great way, a uh, great example of sharing space and resources. With art projects are intimate um, and small scale, but they have a profound ripple effect as they impact the community during the process and for many years to come. By engaging in the artistic process and interacting with professional artists, people have the chance to express themselves and often gain a deeper understanding of their own communities. We manage the uh, process pretty carefully so that both the artist and the community gets what they need out of it. Um, we've worked with a number of community groups, uh, newcomer groups, gay uh, um, uh, resource center for gay, lesbian, and transgendered youth, a food bank, um, a resource center for solvent users, and that's just to name a very, very few. The final piece was this bike rack that you just saw, and it was installed outdoors just uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's pretty great. And this is just one of 50 projects that we've done. Um, I just also want to give a shout out to the Creative City Network. I started coming to the, I came to the very first uh, um, conference back uh, 13 years ago, I think it was, when I was just hired to create a, a policy. And it has been invaluable in producing the program that we now have. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon everyone. I just want to start off by saying and sort of echoing where Jane left off and saying it's really nice to have such a captive audience for public art, so please don't leave. Um, I'll try to keep you entertained for the next four minutes. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here on behalf of the city of Mississauga and to present uh, Tree Quilts, which was a project uh, that was installed late last year. Uh, boring slide, but I'll just walk you through it quickly. Uh, essentially, it came out of a, a very big ideas section with uh, Parks and Forestry and Culture, and we were talking about, uh, you know, how do we animate very busy intersections, uh, specifically in the downtown core, and how do we give it this sort of punch of color amongst, you know, of a, somewhat of a concrete-looking uh, space, uh, especially in the winter. So we had a very modest budget to start off with. We had $10,000 doesn't mean much in, in sometimes in, you know, in the grand scheme of things, but we really stretched it as far as we could, and I think the results was, um, was far exceeded our expectations. So the project was installed in December of 2014. It was uh, installed in March, and uh, the result was a project called Tree Quilts by an arts collective called Fugitive Glue. <laughs> To orient you a little bit with the lay of the land, um, it's like I said, it's right in the downtown core, so it's walking distance to our city hall, all of our major sort of cultural landscape um, and our landmarks, uh, very busy transit corridor as well, so there's a ton of eyes on this project. So it was a, it was a very uh, risky endeavor that we undertook, but um, I'm glad it paid off in the end. 
this is the site. So um, if anyone's familiar with uh, Mississauga, this is here Ontario Street and Burnham Thorpe. And uh, the Marilyn Monroe Towers may ring a bell and in some people's minds. So this is a large development that was installed uh, or that was developed a few years back um, at, right at the corner, basically, of Burnham Thorpe and here Ontario. And right in the middle of that intersection is about 52 large oak trees uh, that come October, November of every year, uh, become somewhat of a, almost a Christo installation in themselves, and, uh, and they get burlapped. Um, and uh, so they, they really went, were in need of a, a little of a punch of color. So fugitive glue, I'll move on to the next one, is um, what we did was we essentially put out a call and uh, fugitive glue really took us far as they could with uh, their interpretation of what punch of color meant to them. So they wrapped uh, 11 of our trees out of the 52 and they w meant to reference the 11 wards of Mississauga. So they used hand-woven, knitted, crocheted uh, fabrics, and this was a huge thing that they pulled off in a very short amount of time. And uh, w with the help of the city's contractor, they were able to install uh, the pieces on this very busy intersection. This is to give you some uh, an idea of exactly where they're located. So the Marilyn Monroe Towers are right in the background. So I love the, the juxtaposition of the two, the architecture, the built form, the, uh, the natural landscape, as well as uh, sort of this traditional way of crocheting. I think it actually um, looks quite beautiful. Uh, these lasted for the, the few months that, um, you know, four or five months that they were there. And we had people um, actually write to us saying that they rode the bus intentionally round and round so that they can kind of get a look at them, which was wonderful to hear. To give you a few more pictures, uh, they looked really lovely uh, when the sun was setting or when the sun was rising. Uh, so just this sort of punch of color um, in the environment. And right at the corner um, of uh, the screen on the right-hand side, you have another beautiful piece that was installed earlier by the developer, uh, by Francisco Gazatua, called Buen Amigo. And I believe Helena, um, if she's in the room, she had helped out with that project as well. And uh, so, you know, we're already sort of building this really great uh, permanent and temporary uh, public art collection in this saga. And here's the bell. So here's a few more pictures. And I do have a sneak peek on, this has become so successful that we're actually uh, making this into an annual initiative. So come this November, uh, we will have a, a project um, entitled The Lifeline Project by um, an arts collective as well, and they're using military grade paracord. And this is somewhat of a departure from last year, so um, if anyone is interested in seeing how this actually pans out, uh, give me a call, shoot me an email, I'd be happy to send you some pictures. Thank you. Thanks very much. I read somewhere that this was Pecha Kucha, which is 20 by 20, so which I calculated at 6 minutes and 40 seconds. So I'm going to read so I stay focused and sound like an auctioneer. Uh, my name's Rebecca Carbon. I run the public art program at Waterfront Toronto. The commission that I want to speak to you today, uh, which uh, Geraldine just mentioned, comes out of a really thoughtful document the Waterfront Toronto commissioned and was passed by a city council in 2009. And this document laid the groundwork for our public art program, the principles behind which are to uh, pool public art contributions in every neighborhood that we develop in into really high profile locations and to take a curatorial approach with sort of the idea of commissioning a, co a cohesive collection that speaks to some sort of uh, thematic thread. Um, the site that we're looking at today um, is actually, it was a uh, post, it is a post-industrial brownfield site, um, was very barren, toxic, and is now going to be a very generously scaled pedestrian prioritized boulevard with a series of artworks that reference the natural and historical uh, nature, but also the future as a sustainable neighborhood. Um, leading Japanese Paris-based artist Tadashi Kawamata has exhibited with premier institutions and in unconventional sites uh, across Asia, Europe, and America. Uh, we were thrilled that we'd created an opportunity uh, that enticed an artist of this caliber to submit to a competitive process. Um, Kawamata had shown tr in Toronto before. In 1989, he did a project with Mercer Union on Yonge Street. 
there's a sort of grainy image of it here. And he had also done a project in 2013 with, uh, with Nuit Blanche, uh, right outside the Metropolitan United Church on Queen Street. We were, uh, Kawamata's works are for the most part temporary and are created for a particular place and time. And each work is unique, responding to the architecture, the housing, the social attitudes, and the specific cultural concerns of the urban environment in which it is executed. However, in 2014, he uh, completed his first permanent work for Waterfront Toronto. And when the jury shortlisted him, there was some concern, some question around how he would translate his typical um, temporary, uh, the, his typical practice, which was in temporary and, and wood, uh, into a uh, permanent relevance and uh, for, for a, a permanent siting in a harsh climate, because wood is obviously not a great, not a great material for that. Uh, but he came up with an excellent solution um, that was entirely suitable to the permanent condition and entirely, and entirely in keeping with his, with his world-renowned practice of working with found objects. The artist who lives in Paris had, of course, been to Toronto a couple times before and had noticed that we have this quirky planning habit, urban design habit, of trying to distinguish neighborhoods by giving them particular um, pieces of furniture, like uh, benches, uh, and, and lampposts that sort of are supposed to define that neighborhood. So his proposal was to assemble a selection of lampposts in styles found in and around town, like a haphazardly grasped bundle of sticks. And the piece collapses history and geography into one playful gesture that sort of resembles uh, a Japanese children's game called Mikado sticks, which is a lot like pickup sticks, and I suspect several centuries older than pickup sticks. Um, I'm gonna skip what I was saying here and here. Um, although, Kawamata's work on, uh, although Kawamata works on an architectural scale, um, in contrast to the architectural surroundings of his work, his, his work has often a very fragile and ephemeral appearance, and even in this permanent rendition you can see that. He's always very concerned about, how, about carefully citing his works, and here's sort of the point of my, my uh, presentation. We did, that, we did all this kind of uh, work with the artist and then we went to the city because we always hand over our works to the city of Toronto and we hit a snag here. We found out that Toronto Hydro planned to install a, a lamppost uh, within a meter or two of where we were putting our whole bundle of lampposts. So everybody risked looking really stupid. Um, we made all sorts of, uh, we did all sorts of lumen studies showing we have, we're putting in 30 lampposts, you don't need that lamppost, but they, but they wouldn't take it. They wouldn't remove the lamppost, they wouldn't move the lamppost, so with some trepidation, trepidation, we looked at option three, which was to move the artwork, and we uh, at first talked about moving the, art the artwork further away, as I just showed, then we thought, okay, they're not gonna move their lamppost, we can't, we're, what, you know, there was a eureka moment. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. If we couldn't get rid of this lamppost by deletion or moving, we would completely absorb it. We would shuffle our own cluster of historic and variant lampposts up to the planned streetscape lamppost and embrace it, actually tie our foundations into its own. Of course, this had to go all the way up to the top of Hydro, but it did get approved. <laughs> and the result is remarkable. <laughs> The work, the work has a heightened sense of integration and riffing on the public realm within which it exists. From some angles, the streetscape post completely disappears into the organic jumble. And from others, one gets the sense that one of the cluster has got a mind of its own, extricated itself from the crowd and asserted itself. And the really magical part is that then the rigid pattern of the streetscape lampposts begin to read as a multiplication of this rogue agent. The sculpture goes beyond a sense of growing out of the public realm, but gives a sense that this element of the public realm, in fact, grows out of the artwork. Through the artwork, this public realm, thoughtfully planned and roundly praised, is part of a continuing story of city building that stretches into the past and the future. And here's what's really interesting. 25 years before we did this project, Mercer Union, who were the ones behind the first piece that I showed, wrote, Kawamata's organic forms not only embrace their surroundings, but threaten to subsume the adjacent architecture, sub subverting its overriding symmetry. The integration of organic forms has a humanizing effect on the brick and, brick and concrete surroundings. 
<coughs> this humanization of dehumanized spaces and the reintegration of the natural into the urban environment form his essential concerns. And I have one more thing to say. One more. <laughs> um, while we can make our plans, there, is always, there always has to be a flexibility and agility to address these unforeseen challenges as they may arise. And who better to have at the table to address those problems than an artist? Artist needs to be, needs to be <coughs> actively involved in the discussions that inform the parameters of their project. They need to be engaged early, meaningfully, and consulted as much as possible to ensure the best and most meaningful integration of their work into the bigger picture because, after all, it is the bigger picture that the art will bring to the site. Wow, some great projects, would you not agree? Would you like to see this session happen again at next year's summit? So I just want to thank the uh, presenters. It's a real tough task to have four minutes and a great deal of passion to talk about some of these projects and then be cut off by a horn. So, um, But I think it allows us to see a lot of projects really quickly and get that sense, much like our previous session about acquiring lots of information um, in a very short period of time. So thank you very much for uh, participating, being engaged, being here. Uh, I know the presenters really appreciate that. Uh, and we'll we'll be here doing it again next year. Thank you so much to Geraldine for uh, spearheading this for us and also chairing the uh, the public art roundtable as part of our pre-conference uh, session. And we have a small token of thanks. <laughs>